James, so lovely to see you on screen. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. I've had your songs. See, there are only two songs of yours. So to have you on repeat is, is two songs over and over again, but they're really good songs to have on repeat. So I'm not, I'm not at all happy about it. Uh, there's more music coming. I promise you that. There's going to be lots more music next year. So, you know, you'll have a bit more time to get through it all. But I appreciate it. It's nice to hear that you're playing it. Yeah, they're fantastic songs. But I'll get to the, those songs. I wanted to start by um, asking you about your teenage life because I was reading that you performed a lot in your teens that your family would go out on weekends with you so you could perform. When did you first get that impulse to perform? It, it was, it started even before my teenage years, to be honest. Like I, I first hopped on stage when I was just four years old and, um, and truly like I was on stage at four, you know, I was a, um, my very first song was a song called Friends in Low Places by Garth Brooks. And if you know the song, you know, it's not a very appropriate song for a four year old to be singing, but uh Anyway, so I, pretty much from that moment on, I just singing and being an entertainer was just something I just wanted to do. You know, I just loved it. Um, so my parents, you know, we had this old Land Cruise. We used to jump all in the front of this, this bench seat of the Land Cruise and we used to just travel around the country. And quite often, because I was quite young then, um, I wasn't allowed to enter talent contests and all that sort of stuff. So I used to get up in between like the talent contests. So, you know, the, so I, when the McClymonts and everything were going through those teenage years, I was this little kid that was kind of, you know, would just jump up in between them and sing a song. Oh, that is great. Well, I'm sure they would remember you because there can't have been too many little kids popping up. Between actors. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, were you singing and playing at that stage or did you have like a no. backing track? No, yeah, I'd normally do like backing tracks or something like that. Yeah, I started playing guitar when I was probably like 10 years old. Um, and then like could actually kind of properly back myself probably around like 12 years old or something. So it took me a little while. But I, uh, even that that very first gig, I, I held the guitar like I held it like I was ready to play it. I just couldn't play it. Yeah. So when you started playing, because often I think when one starts playing guitar, there are songs you really want to play thinking, yeah, I can learn the chords for this song. So was, it, was there any like artists or songs in particular you thought, yeah, great, now I can play these songs on guitar? Yeah, I, it was funny. I, I kind of loved three styles of music. And, and the best way to describe this, the first like albums that my mum bought me was um, we bought it from Sanity. And I went in there and she thought, you know, she had Wiggles or, you know, Hi-Fi, whatever it was at the time. And I asked for the best, like the Elvis compilation album. I asked for the Garth Brooks album. And I asked for Harry Connick Jr., right? So just to give All you right. an idea, of like, it was like a five-year-old asking for music. So, you know, clearly there was some sort of musical gene that came through. Um, so I think like, I guess a lot of Elvis actually guitaring from the very first days, you know, it was, it was all fairly three chord stuff. So I think I played a lot of Elvis, funnily enough. Um, it's so interesting you say Harry Connick Jr. because I did have a question like later on and pointing to where my questions are written down um, and about your voice and I, I think I'll ask it now because that I know Harry Connick Jr.'s music and his voice and I can and interesting you also say Elvis because your voice has this really warm tone like this almost crooning tone yet this kind of stadium size awareness in it if that makes sense and so oh. it's almost like you so it feels a bit like you're singing to invite you know, a million people into your living room. <laughs> which I love is, that. Just, so I, I, I love that. So well, I think, yeah, cool. Harry Connick obviously was, you know, that, and Elvis is such, has such an incredible tone as well. So um, not that you actually sound like either artist, but that context is really interesting to have. Well, it, it's funny that you mentioned that. So I, I grew up with country and then at about probably 16, I started to step away from country a little bit and I went and just tried different styles of music. And the last... Um, kind of my early 20s, I spent a lot of time in like big, kind of big band style stuff, doing a lot of the Michael Booth, like Harry Connick Jr. stuff. Um, I was doing soul. I was, I did a lot of rock. Like I played, you know, every little country pub playing all the, the classic 80s stuff. So I did try lots of different styles of music. And I'm really thankful for that now because I bring all of those influences into my sound and I love, you know, great blues artists. I, I, I love, um, all different styles of music so I, I think at the core I'm a country artist but I do love bringing different influences in. I suppose it also means that if for example you like something happens at a gig and the power goes out and I saw that happen to Shane Nicholson once I was at a show and he was like the power went and he just stood up with a guitar and started yeah. playing and I thought to have that in your repertoire for you like all those different styles I would imagine power goes out you can sing a whole lot of different songs just you yeah. on your a cappella or with a guitar. 
Absolutely. I actually love those moments, to be honest. I love those moments where you're just like, all right, there is, I've been actually doing quite a lot of um, like radio stuff at the moment. And in some, I've been doing some performances while going into the radio station and play for just the staff. And some of those, especially up in kind of regional areas, there's no PA, no nothing. So I've just got to stand there with a the guitar and I've just got to perform. And there's something that's so, you know, you feel naked because it's everything stripped. You've got no microphone, you've got nothing. But uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of thankful of my like, you know, pub rock days for those moments that I can just kind of get up there and just, and just drum a chord, you know. So the pub rock days, from what I understand, were after you finished school. You were, you know, you took off around Australia in the car and just played any pub you could find. I'm wondering what you might have learned about audiences doing that, because it's one thing to learn about yourself as an artist, but in that environment, you know, you're getting some pretty immediate feedback, whether it's people turning away or expressing that their dislike of your set list. So <laughs> did it teach you a lot? A huge amount, a huge amount with like just engaging people and connecting you know the one thing that I'm constantly watching when I'm up on stage like have I captured this audience you know like there's one thing to play songs there's two types of audiences that like ways that I feel um you either going to an audience or you're bringing an audience to you and I love both of those and doing a combination the way I describe this is when I first start my set I want to start with a huge energy right I want to start out with a big song something like raise like that just big drum intro and I want everyone to go all right we're here pay attention sort of thing and then I normally the first three songs I go really really big and then I kind of strip it all back to an acoustic guitar and just have that moment and that's the moment that I'm like all right now come into my world you know and it's like I've gone out into your world and I've created this big energy but now I, I want to come bring it back in um yeah I, I love that and I think those learning how to do that and learning how to kind of bring people on, on your journey especially when you're playing live all of that just comes from playing in pubs and and lots of ruthless people being like don't play that you suck <laughs> so yeah. you know it, 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 it's I'm glad that I went through that process I mean, obviously you'd get a bit of a thick skin doing that, but I, but then the balance is as an artist, you need to not have too thick a skin to be able to keep connecting with your material. So is it like a constant push me, pull you of trying to be resilient, but still being vulnerable? Yeah, it is. Especially when it comes to actually the songwriting side of things yeah. where, you know, staying true to who you are as an artist and creating music that's authentic to, to me. Um, and, and, listening to what's happening in the, the market and listening and, and studying other great songs and finding out what hip music's doing, but not then kind of letting that go and then just creating art that represents me. I find more in a songwriting sense, I find that um, that's just a push and pull that you got to constantly juggle. Yeah, interesting. So you talked about songwriting and uh, after you did your uh, your stint in pub gigs uh, all over Australia, you went to Nashville. And uh, from what I was reading, you wrote over 300 songs while you were there, which is hugely productive. Um, so I'm wondering, because Raise Like That's your first single, how do you choose when you've got that many songs? What do you decide on for that big announcement to the world? It was very difficult, first off, um, to, to choose that first song, because I do have a huge amount of back catalogue um, that I've written over the years. I wanted to come out with a few criteria, right? With my first song. One, I wanted to come out with something that was joyful, something that was a celebration. I, I was really important that I, I wanted to come out with something that's kind of upbeat and made you feel good. Um, along with that though, I wanted to come up with something that was really honest and represented and got people to know who I am a little bit more. And, you know, if they listen to this song, they're like, cool, I get to know James a little bit better. I also wanted to write a song that other people can plug their lives into. You know, I think that's something I always try and achieve with my songwriting is that, it is my song when I write it. And then as soon as I release it, it no longer becomes my song. It is the song and it, and it will have the life that it has. And I love the idea that, you know, an example, for instance, there's a song called um, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up To Be Cowboys, right? There's this <laughs> great <laughs> right. 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 song. My dad always used to sing me that song when I used to go to bed as, as a kid. So that now becomes my dad's and my song, right? It's no longer Willie Nelson, the Wailing Jetting song, it's our song. And I love that I, um, music can do that. And something amazing that happened with my first single is that a lot of people have taken ownership outside of me of that song. And, uh, and I absolutely love that. Well, a lot of people to the tune of over a million streams actually, um, and all over the world. So is it, um, is it, does it feel right? Or does it feel weird that you have fans all over the world now, considering, you know, you haven't been able to tour overseas or anything like that. Um, it's your yeah. first song. It's, it's a huge achievement. It is amazing. It, it's, 
it blows me away still how much it's reached. And, and you know, there, there's been a few moments throughout this process that have kind of, I've gone, wow, this is crazy. Like uh, one being it went big in the line dancing community in Malaysia, right? I didn't know there was a line dancing community in Malaysia, but apparently there it's a big thing over there. So on YouTube, if you type in raise like that, there is like hundreds of videos of people lying dancing to raise like that in Malaysia. And then, you know, people sending me like, um, I got sent a video the other day with this whole big group line dancing in San Diego, walking down the street. And it's just crazy that this little song that I wrote right here in this studio by myself in my bedroom that I created is now like there's hundreds of people walking down the street in San Diego doing a line dance to it. It's, that still blows me away. Well, I suppose that that's also a byproduct, well, not a byproduct, but an effect of you having that awareness that once you once you release the song, it doesn't belong to you anymore. So I'm curious how you arrived at that sense of your work, because it's something that a lot of great artists have, that sense that, well, I'm sort of the caretaker of the work for a little bit of time and then it's released. Is that something you've had from the start of your songwriting? No, I, I think the process of writing so many songs taught me a lot. And I, I truly tr treated, especially last year, 2020, I wrote like a couple, like about 200 songs just last year alone. And I really treated it like a job. I wanted to, I studied music. Like I treated it like, all right, I'm going to wake up and I'd often find a song that I'm loving or from any genre and I'd deconstruct it. And I'd sit there and be like, why is this working? Why does this make me feel something? Or what's the drums doing in this? What's the bass doing? What are they doing lyrically? And through that process, I just kind of learned a lot. And I learned a lot of like, all right, well, that's why that, that works or what well, that doesn't work. And that's why, that's why it makes me feel something. Maybe that might make somebody else feel something too. Um, I, th I feel like only through that process and having all of those tools now at my disposal, could I truly write the most honest version of what I wanted to write. Right. And those skills to be able to deconstruct songs like that, is that, did you actually have an education in music, like a formal education in music, or these are just things you picked up? No, it just, it just comes from a passion. It's, it's very much the person that I am. I love just figuring out. I'm, I'm constantly going, how does that work? How does that happen? So uh, no, that's just, that's kind of my personality. And I've, I've never had a formal education in that sense. I just, I just have a passion for it. And curiosity as well. I think ha it. hand in hand. Yeah. So when yeah. you do write songs, and obviously that's a process in, in, in deducing the elements of a song, but for your own songwriting, do you allocate time, sit down, write it, um, or do you wait for the ideas to come and then think, okay, I'm going to stop now and write this? Um, I, I kind of believe in the idea that creativity is a muscle and you've got to keep working it, right? So I do definitely sit down and allocate time to write music. However, with that being said, most of the time, those songs I write aren't the songs that I release and they're not the best songs. Okay. But by doing that process of just working at it and having that creative muscle ready to go, then when I'm driving along and I'm like, oh, I just got this idea and I think that's the idea, then I'm ready. And it's not like I haven't written a song for six months and then I have to go and try and just come up with the best song I can because of that moment of inspiration, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, I am constantly writing. I definitely sit down to write, but most of the best songs that I write um, come from like, you know, out of nowhere. So it's like you're clearing out the the, the flotsam and jetsam in your brain in a way. Absolutely. It's like the, the, the book, The Artist's Way, that suggests doing morning pages every morning. Yep. A lot of people do that. So it's, yeah, it's, um, it's a good technique, obviously, because it's working. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of songwriting, um, continuing to speak of songwriting, your new song is Small Town, and you are, in fact, from a small town, which is Wingham on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. So uh, what made you decide to essentially pay tribute to your your small town your hometown yeah small. so I, I actually started writing that song talking about moments of inspiration and that was a great example of that I was driving um leaving Brisbane and I was heading back to, to Wingham it's about an eight hour drive or something and I was just so excited to get back home you know get back to the family farm my farm's still there it's it's just like I love I still call it my home you know even though I've been here for 10 years and I was just so excited and I was like I want to capture this moment right so I wrote most of that song just in my head as I was just driving. I kind of had the idea and I started writing it. And then I brought my song, my co-writer Nolan, and I describe him as like my, uh, he's like the finesse, you know, I, I kind of come up with the bulk of it. And, and then I say, I've got this idea. This is what it is. Here's the chorus or whatever. And he's like, Oh, do this and do that here and fix this. And this, this can tighten it up. Um, and then that's how that kind of, that came about. So what you hear today truly was just my story of driving back to my home and then I, you know, once I got home, I sat down, I started producing the song. And I just wanted to capture the feeling within the production and everything like that. And, and truly 
Small Town, I just want it to be another celebration. It's one of those songs that I want people to crank up really loud in the car and kind of lose themselves and just enjoy the moment. Um, it's, it's not, you know, I've got lots of songs that are really deep and really connected. This song is just one of those ones that I want it to be a bit more joyful and a little bit, a little bit lighter. Yeah, you can certainly hear the joy in your voice, I've got to say. So I imagine for this summer, the Australian summer, it will be a, um, a great party song, especially as we can all now have parties. Um, and as I've introduced the topic of restrictions, you're in Queensland, which has been less restricted than other states. So I imagine you've been able to keep playing. But uh, yeah. did you have itchy feet last year, for example, when we were all locked down? Yeah, like it was funny because I was supposed to move to Nashville um, on the 1st of March, 2020, right? And oh, right. sorry, not the 1st of March, the 11th of March, 2020, they closed the airports on the 1st of March, right? And when I mean I was ready to move, I had sold up my entire life, like guitar in the hand, backpack, ready to go. Wow. So I was expecting my life to be completely flipped upside down. So it wasn't totally scary. And I, was, I just kind of accepted it. it was what it was. The whole world was going through the same thing. I was like, all right, well, you know, it, it is what it is. Um but I was expecting my life to be completely changed anyway. So it, it didn't, it, in a weird way, it wasn't as scary as I think it could have been if I just got blindsided by it. Yeah, right. Um, and I'm running out of time. So I'm going to ask you one last question. And you flagged it at the top, which is that there is more music coming. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping there'll be more singles next year and out on the road. Yeah, definitely. Lots more music coming next year. We're going to keep it out, keep it coming a bit more consistent. Um, it's just going to be lots of stories about from like going back to, you know, talking about my childhood, but um, I'm about to have a baby boy in about three weeks time. So there's probably going to be some music about family and, and just the, the life that I'm living at the moment. So there's lots of exciting things happening. And then, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of great festivals are, are coming off and I'm going to be playing some of my, my favorite festivals next year. And we've got the whole band and it's, it's going to be great. Well, it's you certainly primed for those big those big festival stages with all the experience you've had, your amazing voice and your great song. So I'm sure fans will love seeing you in festivals. I've loved hearing these songs and very much looking forward to the new ones. Thank you for talking Thanks to so me. Much. Thanks, Graham. Have a great day. See you too. Soon.